excited to have Matt Vance here today with us. He is the Woodwind Product Specialist for North America for Buffet Crampon USA. Um, thank you so much for your time and for being here today with us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to see you both. I'm glad you're both healthy and well, and uh, uh, glad to be here. It's always a pleasure to support uh, our friends at Midwest Musical Imports. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, well, might as well jump right in with uh, our first question for you. Um, you know, with clarinets, it's a lot about the, the bore and the different, you know, what that means for different models. So as kind of an overview, um, are you able to speak to, you know, we hear the term polycylindrical bore a lot and just kind of going more in depth as to what that means, um, maybe later going into what that means for each of the models that we're going to talk about. Um, that and the reverse taper is another term that we hear a lot for barrel specifically, um, kind of going into that also in a bit more detail. Sure. So um, what, what I've learned over my many years with Buffet Grand Pond USA is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of players and a lot of customers don't realize that there are different models and different bore families uh, within Buffet Grand Pond clarinets. Um, the one, the professional model that almost everyone is familiar with is the R13 clarinet, which is this instrument right here. Um, this is the most popular professional clarinet in the world. Um, it was introduced by Buffet Grand Pond in 1955, and it was designed by a legendary acoustician named Robert Carré, or Robert Carré, at uh, the workshop uh, at the factory in Montlaville, France, which is just outside of Paris. And the R13 is significant for a lot of different reasons. Um, Amelia, as you referenced a, a few minutes ago, uh, it is responsible for the introduction of the polycylindrical bore. And the polycylindrical bore has become uh, pretty much the bore design and the gold standard for all modern clarinet design, uh, not only by Buffet Carpon, but by all clarinet manufacturers worldwide. A lot of the other brands have taken this basic design and modified it for their particular models. Um, we have other bore families. Uh, there's the RC bore family which is also a polycylindrical bore design. And then there's the tradition board family, which is a cylindrical board design. And we'll get into a discussion of both of those uh, in a minute. But the R13 is notable because of that polycylindrical board design. And up to, the, up to until 1955, um, clarinet design had never incorporated a polycylindrical bore. And what that means in very simplistic terms is you have one cylinder on the top and another cylinder on the bottom. So you have two cylinders that are stacked on top of each other. And this creates a dynamic within the instrument in terms of the airflow and the spinning of the air that creates what everyone likes to refer to as the buffet ring to the sound that everyone uh, says they get from the R13 or any of the other uh, professional clarinets. The R13 was the first clarinet to do that when it was introduced in 1955. And as a result, we've had a lot of different models that have grown out of that polycylindrical bore design or have been derived from that. Uh, you look at models within the R13 bore family like the Festival or the Tosca or the R13 Prestige. All of those take the basic bore design of this instrument and modify it with either different tonal placement or different key work or different uh, wood density. All those variations are complementary to what we have with the R13 polycylindrical bore design, that, that kind of baseline for where we're, we're making all the other clarinets. So it really started with that design in 1955 to where we took the two cylinders and we kind of stacked them on top of each other. And that gave us that, that ring to the sound and that resistance that everyone likes on an R13 clarinet and uh, just the playability of it. Um, you'd also ask about the reverse taper when we're talking about barrels. So with reverse taper barrels, and when we, were, when we talk about a reverse taper barrel, we're talking about um, some of the ones most people are familiar with are like the Maynig, um, Hadash, uh, the recent introduction by Buffet with the Icon barrels. And what that does, um, and both of you could probably speak to this as, as clarinetists, is that that reverse taper helps with the tuning of the twelves. It helps improve the intonation from the, the lower register to the upper register. For example, when you're playing a B flat and then you go to an F, tuning up that octave and that fifth 
to where it's a little more aligned and you're not having to do as much as far as adjustment with your embouchure and your air and, and maybe some alternate fingering. So that's why a lot of players are really drawn to the reverse taper barrels like the Icon or the Mini because it really helps improve that tuning on the 12s. Definitely. Yeah, definitely the tuning and definitely for me, um, you know, put that focus, right? Sometimes, and especially as your clarinet, we notice this a lot at MMI, as your clarinet starts to get more broken in and a little bit more free, people are looking for that resistance again, right? And then you'll, you'll tap into the Manig um, or the Hadash to kind of create a little more resistance and obviously to help with the pitch and a little more focus on the clarinet. It's a great alternative to buying a whole new clarinet right away. <laughs> but eventually, myself included, you know, your clarinet starts to tap out and it's probably time. <laughs> exactly. And so Tori, you're saying that in addition to the tuning uh, benefits from a reverse taper, you always you also like the fact that it's giving you a little more resistance, a little more to push against, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I've had a few Manigs over the years, and that's usually what I'm kind of looking for. You know, I have an older clarinet, it's from 1970s, and, you know, um, tuning is a big part of it. But for me, I'm just looking for a little more focus, a little more resistance, because I really, I like that. I like to be able to blow against it. So for me, the Manigs really, you know, that that's what it does for me. So, yeah, sure. I, would, I would definitely agree with that. I think comparing um the stock barrel is good but then after tori what you said about kind of after it's like broken in and some time has passed and if you were to play then with a manig or a hadash i think there's a huge difference and ever since i started playing on a manig you know years ago it was really hard to not ever play on one again i've always had one since <laughs> you know, a couple and um yeah that's a huge bonus in addition to the intonation which is already a big help you know with the with the 12s like you were saying but the focus is just uh, it makes things so much easier and it makes the colors i think ring a lot more too and you get um more of like those overtones as well sure, sure you know one other thing to add with with the different barrel options when we're talking about maining or hadash with the the icon barrels that we introduced a few years ago um the the ring design on those is a little bit different it's a little bit thinner but you also have plating options too you have rose gold or you have silver or black nickel and those choices can also influence the sound that you're going to get because of the different resonance of the different platings. And, and a lot of people don't realize this, but everything contributes to the response of the instrument and the sound of the instrument. Um, and just those subtle variations of having a different plating on the rings or a different diameter of the rings, that can often make a huge difference in how the clarinet responds and sounds. Yeah. And Matt, as, as far as you know, um, are the, the barrels, like say with an R13, are those, um, just so people know, that is not part of the polycylindrical um, component of the clarinet. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, the, the stock barrel that comes with the instrument is, is cylindrical. So, okay. um, and the instruments, um, I get a lot of questions about, are the barrel and the bell matched to the instrument? And the answer is yes. When yeah. they play test the clarinets in the factory, they are matching up the barrel and the bell to the instrument. And, and the, the, the urban legend of when these, these clarinets are play tested is that the barrel and the bell are unstamped when they're play testing them uh, by the, the play testers at the factory in Montmobile. And what they do is they do quarter turns with each component. And when they find the sweet spot on the barrel and the bell, then that's when they apply the stamp to the instrument. Now, I haven't seen that happen in person. I've only been to the factory a couple of times, so I can't verify 100% if that's true or not, but I think it makes for a cool story. That so. is a cool story, and that would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but there really is, you know, you have to remember this is a wood instrument that, that's made uh, primarily by hand. So each instrument's going to play a little bit different, and those variations as far as where you turn the barrel and where you turn the bell can make a difference as far as the resonance and the response of the clarinet. And it just looks cool when everything's lined up too. Right, well, that yeah, that's a, a good point. I think when I was, uh, my first year of college, um, a teacher mentioned that to me and I was like, what do you mean the, the stamps aren't supposed to be lined up, you know? And they're like, just give it a try. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. Definitely spin things around, see what else, what other sounds you can get out of that, so. 
Oh yeah, there's definitely going to going to probably be a sweet spot for both of those components on your instrument that really make the instrument sing. Yeah, very true. Very true. Yeah, just well, just continuing on again with the bore and talking about now going into specific models, especially um, the the big ones that we carry, the R13, the Tradition, the Festival, but then also the the new gala. Talking a little bit about that since that's new to to all of us, um, getting some more insight on that and what the those design concepts have to do with the sound that we get from those ones as well. Sure. Well, let's let's talk about the Gala clarinet, or as, as my French colleagues refer to it, the Gala clarinet. This is a brand new model that was introduced actually in the European market in 2020. And um, it was very successful over there. It was a very good response to this clarinet. And so we weren't we weren't sure we were going to introduce it into the, into the North American market. And we got some samples and we had some of our artists play test it. And the feedback was very, very positive on this clarinet. And we decided to bring it over to the United States and Canada uh, because we felt like it was going to be a good fit. And the timing of the gala clarinet is really, I think, ideal considering the situation that we're all in right now. You know, fortunately, it seems like we're starting to slowly emerge from the pandemic and more and more people are getting vaccinated. But, uh, you know, the economy is, is still kind of in a, in a precarious situation right now. And people are, are obviously watching their budgets. And the gala clarinet is an exciting entry for a lot of different reasons. But I think one of the, the really important things to consider with this instrument is that this is a professional clarinet from Bouffe Crampon, but it's at a price point that's a little more affordable than what you find with the R13. Um, I think a lot of customers have migrated to the secondary market and looking at used clarinets. And uh, there's certainly an appeal to that uh, because you're getting a uh, professional clarinet at a, at a lower price point. The drawbacks are it's an older clarinet. It's likely not going to have any warranty coverage. And you don't know the history of the instrument often. You don't know what that clarinet has been through. So I think the Gala clarinet, because of the price point, is the timing of it is terrific because it's the option and gives the ability to a customer to be able to purchase a professional buffet clarinet that's made on the same assembly line as the R13, but you're able to get it at a lower price point and a little more affordable if you're not able to afford the R13. Um, and it's a wonderful instrument. As you can see, it has silver plated keys. Uh, the distinctive look of it has black nickel on the ring. So it's, it's different looking than the other professional clarinets. Um, it has a flat bell bottom instead of the rounded bell bottom that, of the R13. So that's a little different feature of it. And it's a polycylindrical bore. So it's a, it's a bore design derived from the R13. It's a little bit larger in diameter than the R13 bore. So it's a little freer blowing and a little less resistant. So if, if you're looking for a clarinet that is a little freer blowing, um, for me, as I'm primarily a saxophone player and I double on clarinet, I enjoy the fact that this instrument is a little less resistant than an R13 uh, because saxophone players like a little freer blowing instrument. So it offers all of those things. It has leather pads. It comes with two barrels too, which adds to the value. It comes with a 65 and a 66 millimeter barrel. And an A clarinet version is also offered of, uh, of the Gala clarinet. So you have a 64 and a 65 with that particular outfit. So a lot of value for the instrument. It's a beautiful instrument. It really plays well. And, and I think it's, it's a good option, a good secondary or another option for uh, people in the market for a new professional clarinet. Very nice. Yeah, we can't wait for, for it. You said it was June, I believe, that they're going to be available possibly? Yeah, we, we've gotten our first shipment in actually uh, last month and we sold through all of them immediately. Um, so we're expecting more shipments soon and uh, we would love to get some in, in the inventory of MMI. That would be great for your customers okay. to check out. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I can't wait to try it. I know that um, you mentioned, I think, or when it first came out that it was possibly um, being compared to the Tradition family. Can you explain a little bit what that means? Sure. So um, the Tradition Boar family is a little bit different from the R13 Boar family. The R13, as we mentioned earlier, is polycylindrical. The Tradition Boar family, and I can grab one of those here. So this is a Tradition clarinet here. Uh, it's a cylindrical bore, And the Tradition 
was actually derived from a board design of a model from the early 1960s called the BC-20. And that was an instrument that everyone felt like it had a lovely sound. It was really beautiful. And, and, and the problem with the instrument that they found is that it had um, different tuning tendencies. It had a problem playing in tune with itself. So while everybody really loved the sound of the instrument, being able to play it in tune was a challenge for, for players that they didn't really want to deal with that. So the instrument stopped production after a couple of years. When the tradition came around, the tradition project came around in 2016, we went back to that BC-20 cylindrical board design because it was such a beautiful sound. And we started applying modern technology to the board design with the tone hole placement. And we actually put the Tosca tone hole layout on the tradition and it worked beautifully. It really uh, cured a lot of those intonation tendencies that the BC-20 had. And so now we have the tradition clarinet, this is version two. Um, getting back to the Gala clarinet, the Gala clarinet in terms of its sound quality slots most closely to the tradition clarinet. Um, it is more of a polycylindrical bore design like the R13, but with the tone hole placement of the Gala clarinet and its tonal tendencies, its tonal qualities, we felt like it was the best fit to put it in the tradition bore clarinet family. So I think, I think when either one of you play the Gala clarinet, I think you're gonna feel a lot of familiarity to this instrument. Okay. Yeah, that'll be, I can't wait to try it. That'll be good. So what can you talk about the, um, the wood? We get a, this question a lot and you probably do too at different shows, you know, really what is the difference as you're going through the line of, of clarinets? You know, obviously there's a price difference and that usually relates to the wood um, and, you know, what key mechanisms and quality and that kind of thing. But how does, how does that work with, with buffet? Particularly, you can talk about these models that we've been discussing. Sure. So um, all of our clarinets are made of African blackwood or impingo wood or grenadilla wood, whatever you want to call it. It's all the same wood from the same tree, the impingo tree, which is found in Africa. And um, it's a very dense, very hard wood. Uh, in addition to the acoustic properties that African blackwood um, gives us with clarinets or oboes, um, is that it's also very durable. Um, the density of the wood uh, gives us uh, a beautiful sound, gives us great response, and it's also very durable and very resistant to cracking, generally speaking. We know that we do have some cracks over time, but, but uh, with all the, the development and the experimentation that Buffet Grandpon has done with different materials for our clarinets, African blackwood is, is far and away the preferred material that we use and, and has worked best over, over decades, if not centuries. Um, so when we get into the different types of wood for our clarinets, we're not really talking about a different wood, we're talking about a different density or a different cut of wood. So if I take, for example, the R13, and I don't know how well you guys can see this on a, on a webcam, but we've got an R13 here that has stained African blackwood. And then we have a tradition that has unstained African blackwood. So visually, they look a little bit different. Uh, they're also different in terms of the wood on the tradition clarinet is a denser cut of wood. It's coming from deeper in the cut of the African blackwood. Uh, so it's gonna be the older wood and it's gonna be more dense. So theoretically, what it's going to provide is a darker, tighter, more core focus to the sound because of the density of the wood than on the R13. Now, is that better or worse? Not necessarily. It's a, it's a personal preference thing. Um, the R13 is still played by 80% of the world's professional players for a reason. They really like the sound and response that they get from the R13. But you can have a different flavor with something like the Tradition and with that, you're going to have that denser cut of wood that's used for this instrument or any of the other prestige level instruments that you do with the R13. Um, you're also gonna to find too that um, with the R13, because it's stained, that's also gonna affect how the instrument vibrates and responds and resonates as well. Um, anything you do to the wood, uh, the, the trade secret of Buffet Crampon is how we treat the wood, uh, but something like, like the dye that's used on the R13 
also will affect the vibration and the resonance of the instrument as well. Interesting. I never really thought about that part of it, I guess. I always, especially, you know, it's a relatively new thing with the unstained wood, right? Because we're all used to dark black clarinets, right? And when people see the wood, they're like, oh. <laughs> but I never thought about it in that sense. Um, I don't know about you. Did you, Amelia, think, no. think about the staining? So that's that's interesting. Well, and it's it's interesting too because um, the R13 is is really in terms of the professional clarinets that we offer. It's the only truly black clarinet that we have. Um, the e, the E13 is an entry level professional clarinet and it's stained black. And the RC, which is the entry level on that board family, is also black. But everything else is unstained African blackwood. And it's funny because we do have some players and some customers and educators that insist on their students playing the R13 because a clarinet is supposed to be black. <laughs> and, and when you look at African blackwood in its natural state, when it's unstained, it's actually very beautiful. The, the wood grain and different shades of brown and black, and it, it's really lovely. But yeah. um, it's what what surprises a lot of people about the R13 is that the dye that they use on the African blackwood is actually purple. It's not black. It's purple. <laughs> and they oh, have goodness. this they have this mason jar. I, I kid you not. They have this <laughs> mason jar in the factory with this purple dye and they have a brush and they apply the stain to the African blackwood, the purple stain. Wow. And the combination of the purple with the, the chocolatey brownness of the African blackwood gives us the black appearance of the R13. Oh, that's good. I like that. <laughs> so we really have purple clarinets. <laughs> right. Well, I know other manufacturers have made purple clarinets, but we won't get into that. <laughs> right, exactly. Now, the other question that we usually get is the, um, the aging process. Are you able to speak a little bit about that? I know sometimes people don't want to chat about it. I, I can't get into it too much just for the, the trade secret uh, aspect of the aging process, but I will say that the, the wood is aged for, for many, many years um, and uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, to, for the, the acoustic properties of the wood, um, to really get the wood settled, um, to make sure that the, you know, people laugh when I, I tell them this, but it's the truth. Um, African blackwood from the, the Mpingo tree, um, when, when this tree was grown, it, it was not grown with the intent of becoming a clarinet. It was, it was grown with the intent of being a tree. So this wood is learning how to be a musical instrument. And, and that strikes people as funny, but it's the truth. And so the aging process helps stabilize the wood to get it ready to become a clarinet. And both of you know, as, as professional clarinetists, even once you get the clarinet and you start playing it, the wood is still learning how to be a clarinet. It's right. still adapting and it's still changing and settling down to the, to the rigors of, of having warm air blown through it and vibrating and resonating. And um, so all of those things factor into the development of the wood and the, the maturation of the wood uh, from the tree to becoming a musical instrument. Yeah, you're exactly right, you know, and, and you have to remember that it's organic, right? It's not this thing. Yes, it's hardwood, but it's adjusting, you know? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right with that. We have to remember that, we, especially going through the break-in process. A lot of people get frustrated about, with that, but it's so important, you know? You have to train the clarinet. Like you said, that's a good concept. I like that. Train the clarinet to become a clarinet or train the wood to become a clarinet. That's right. And, and that brings up another good point, Tori, is, is the fact that because this is an organic instrument and so much of it is done by hand, every clarinet is going to play a little differently. And that's why uh, a resource like MMI is so important because of the fact that Midwest Musical Imports is able to offer many of the same model for customers to play test because each clarinet is going to play a little differently. And just like if you were buying a car, you wouldn't buy a car online sight unseen. You wanna test drive that car. Clarinets are the same way. You wanna be able to play several of the same model because they're all gonna play a little different. And you wanna make sure that you find the right one for you. And the right one for Amelia 
might not be the right one for Tory, and the right one for Matt Vance, who's a terrible clarinet player, <laughs> probably definitely won't be the right one for Amelia and Tori. And I'm laugh I'm being funny about that, but it, it's really true is that everybody's playing preferences and tendencies are different and clarinets are all going to be different too. So it's very important to be able to play a lot of the same model from a, a good selection. So, you know, your investment is going to get you the right clarinet. Yes. Right. yes. Um, I do want to um, touch on the hand selection again and talk about how people can be able to do that with going down to Jacksonville to see you guys. But before that, just really quick, can we go back to talking about the density of the clarinets and um, how that is in line with the green line models of the instruments as well? Absolutely. That's a great question, Amelia. Um, a lot of people know about green line, but they don't know what it is or, or why we have it or what the benefits are. So green line is a material that, that Buffet Crampon revolutionized, uh, I believe in the mid 1990s. And it was born out of a couple of different reasons. Um, number one is that in the factory, we were looking at all this wasted raw material. So when you make a clarinet in the factory, you put it on a lathe and you take a bunch of wood off the billet of wood to make the clarinet tube. Well, because of that, you're getting a lot of, of grenadilla dust that's literally falling on the floor. So we were looking at this raw material, which is can be expensive, and we're saying, well, we're wasting a lot of this. Is there a way that we can somehow use this to our benefit? Of course, the other side of the coin is clarinets, because they are organic, made out of organic materials, uh, and there are grains in the wood, is that over time, and depending on the climate and the humidity, the instrument can crack. So we wanted to look at being able to, to maximize our raw material usage and also come up with something that has the acoustic properties of, of wood because it is African blackwood, but is very stable and very resistant to cracking and very resistant to temperature and humidity change. And that's where Green Line was born. Um, so in terms of where we offer Green Line as uh, an option on our models, of course, the R13 is available as a Green Line clarinet. The Festival clarinet, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's also available as a Green Line instrument. Um, the Tosca, which is the top of the R13 board family, is available as a Green Line instrument. And this is where people's minds get blown. Because when the Tosca was developed in, I believe, the early 2000s, the Tosca was developed as a Green Line instrument first. The idea was to go to that material and say, we're going to maximize the benefits of that material and come up with a high-end clarinet that really brings Green Line to its full potential. So the Tosca was born. The Tosca was a Green Line clarinet first, and then the wood version came after. And a lot of people are very surprised when they hear that. But yeah, yeah that's the truth. It, it was a Green Line instrument first. And a lot of the, the really uh, prominent clarinetists that play Tosca clarinets today play Green Line instruments. Uh, you take someone like John Manassi, of the American Ballet uh, Orchestra in New York or Pasquale Martinez Forteza of the New York Philharmonic. They are Tosca players that play green line Toscas and they play it because that's what works best for them and that's what they prefer. Right. So uh, there's sometimes there's a little bit of a stigma about green line. Oh, it's it's not real wood or it's it's a composite. And that's just not the case. It's It's a wonderful, viable option for someone that is looking for an alternate to African Blackwood in terms of the stability. But often people all also just choose a green line instrument because it responds the best for them. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's green line is a terrific option for players and, and especially well in, in a location like Minneapolis where it gets yeah. very cold and very dry. Mm -hmm. uh, a green line instrument is a terrific option because it can handle those humidity and temperature changes much better than an African Blackwood instrument. Yeah, and it's the same thing, um, you know, lately we, we've had a few customers kind of inquire about festival um, green line clarinets. And it's the same kind of concept, you know, with selecting an instrument, um, you know, the, they're gonna be variables in the 
in that line as well you know so people are like oh well it should they should all be very stable and very similar all the green lines should be you know but it's not it's right it still has the organic component to it but um yeah do you want to talk a little bit about the festival and what that Sure. So to, to dovetail the green line discussion, uh, you have to remember green line is 80 to 90% African blackwood and it's mixed with an epoxy resin. So it, it does have the acoustic properties of the wood, but it is very resistant to cracking because of the fact that it doesn't have grain. The reason clarinets or oboes or, or wood instruments crack is because of the grain of the instrument. Moisture gets in the grain, it dries out, it gets moist, it dries out, the wood flexes, and then ultimately you get a crack possibly. So the green line gives you that stability because of the fact you don't have to worry about the grain. This is one of my favorite clarinets because of, it presents so much value. This is a prestige level clarinet. Um, it's a member of the R13 bore family. So that means it has the polycylindrical bore that we talked about before with the two cylinders. Um, I think of the festival clarinet as kind of a souped up R13. Um, it has the polycylindrical bore that we've discussed. It has unstained African blackwood. I don't know if you can see, but the, the barrel is, is really beautiful on this instrument. You can see the deep wood grain and the different shades of brown. Um, the festival has silver plated keywork. Um, it has some auxiliary key work too, in terms of the alternate A flat, E flat key that you have on the left hand. So that's a nice addition. Uh, from a value standpoint, um, the festival clarinet comes with two barrels instead of one barrel. It comes with a 65 and a 66. And uh, so you've got barrel options, you've got tuning options with the festival as well. Um, one of the biggest design changes with the festival has to do with the placement of the register tube. Um, the festival, in terms of the placement of the tube, it's three millimeters higher than what you find with the traditional placement of the register tube on the R13. And that can, that can have an effect on a couple of different things. It can obviously have an effect on tuning. It can also have an effect on the response of some of the throat tones. And it'll have an effect on just the general response of the upper register. Um, I, I would kind of turn the question around to you guys as, as clarinetists. Have you found that you you get a different response or different sound with festival clarinets, say compared to the, on R13? Yeah, I definitely do. It is it's exactly like you said. It's a souped up R13, and it's the the sound is just um, it gets so much like fuller and bigger more quickly, um, and it's it's great for orchestral playing. Um, I've never had one, but I just I know people who you know play in orchestras that do have them, and the sound just cuts across very nicely through the orchestra through an ensemble. Um, but also can be versatile for like chamber playing too with all the different colors because it, it is so versatile and it can change on a dime that type of thing so it's it feels really good to play yeah exactly kind of sim very similar the tuning is different um, from you know if you play back to back the R13 to the festival and you know in different ways but a lot of people always talk about you know the left hand um, with the 12s, you know, kind of honing in on that section. And I find personally that the festivals, um, you don't have to work as hard um, to, to get those out for a festival. And tell me, tell me if I'm wrong, but is the bore just slight, or the circumference of the clarinet just slightly bigger than say an R13? Are you, is that? I, I'm not sure. To my knowledge, it's all the R13 bore family clarinets are, are, essentially the same in terms okay. of the core design of the polycylindrical board internally. Okay. Um, I think with the festival, because of that different placement of the register tube, and there is some variation as far as some of the tone hole placement too, all of those things are going to have subtle effects on, on the response and the, and the tuning of the instrument. It just feels like it just creates this big sound, lots of color, um, definitely more ping um, for me. I've, I, I too, it's one of my favorite models um, right now. That may change, you know, whenever you guys, I mean, as soon as I try to get the gala. <laughs> right. <laughs> we can only hope. Well, wait. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, it got a different sparkle. And we've heard that quite a few times um, with people that have purchased them through us. A lot of orchestral players um, have purchased those through us as well, which is, is, says something to a, to kind of what Amelia was saying about the projection 
the flexibility for sure, because you have to be able to do that in that setting. So, well, and that's the really cool thing about you know the the different models that we offer. I sometimes I'll get questions about, well, why do you guys have all these models? Why do you have all these different models in the R13 board family? Why don't you just have the R13? And I, I think that's a valid question, but I think I think both of you just answered that question because of of the subtle variations that you can get with the different models, with the, the different wood, the different tone hole layout, um, the different key platings, which we haven't even gotten into that yet. Um, all of those things contribute to and make the instrument respond and sound differently. And it, again, it depends on the player. Um, I know some players that are absolutely diehard R13 players and will not play a festival clarinet. <laughs> and I know other players that are, are devoted festival players, but won't play an R13 prestige, which is very close in right. design and specs to the festival clarinet. But yeah. for them, it's just, it's a, it's a very different instrument and, and not what they're looking for. So that's, we're able to offer all these different flavors of clarinet and of course the gala is the latest addition to that um that you know for someone that maybe hasn't found the buffet clarinet for them yet being able to play these different models maybe you will finally find the clarinet that works best for you yeah that's very good so speaking of you know getting a, a new clarinet I, we see a lot of times people coming coming down to the showroom in Jacksonville, how, how do people do that? You know, we get some questions about, I wanna go pick my clarinet. How, how is that possible? I know pre-pandemic or after post-pandemic. <laughs> well, the good news is we, we are offering selection tryouts here. Now it has changed a little bit because of the pandemic. Um, and for many months, we weren't having anybody come into the building. And for many months, we weren't in the building. We were working <laughs> remotely. Um, so we're very excited that we're able to offer that to, to customers again. Um, it is a little bit different because of the pandemic, but uh, the procedure is essentially the same. Um, and, and I know as a musician and having picked out instruments before that it, there's not anything more exciting than being able to go to a uh, buffet and being able to pick out a clarinet. Um, of course, MMI has a fantastic selection, and Tori, you've been down here many times and have picked out instruments for, for MMI. But you also have the option as a customer to come to Jacksonville, Florida, to the North American headquarters of Buffet Crumpon USA, and select a clarinet here. You can purchase it through MMI. Um, one, one misconception is that Buffet Crumpon USA sells direct. We do not. If you do come here to select an instrument, you still have to purchase it through a dealer. So if you came here as a customer of Midwest Musical Imports, then you would select a clarinet here and you would purchase the clarinet through MMI. But um, we really enjoy bringing people to Jacksonville. It's always fun for us. Um, it is by appointment only. We don't have a retail space, so it's not like we have a store that you can walk into and just start playing clarinets. You do have to schedule it ahead of time um, for, for a few different reasons. Uh, I think the most important reason is to make sure that we have a selection that is going to be worth your time coming here. Um, we have clarinetists and, and artists come here from all over the United States and Canada. Um, come here from Los Angeles, from Seattle, from New York, from uh, Montreal, from Toronto, and we want to make sure if you're going to take the time and the effort and the money to come to Jacksonville, that you're going to have a really good selection of instruments from which to choose. So um, that's one of the reasons that we want to, to have an appointment scheduled ahead of time. So it's worth your time and worth your money. Um, with the pandemic conditions currently, we do require some things be in place before you visit us. In addition to making an appointment, you have to have a, a negative COVID test. Uh, right before you visit our uh, facility. Um, if you are vaccinated, which hopefully most of you are now, uh, you can bring that as proof as well, but we do still require a test prior to coming into the building. And we just wanna know what models you wanna try. Um, we wanna know if you wanna pick out an R13 or a festival or a tradition or a gala. Um, so we can put those instruments out ahead of time so you're able to walk in and immediately begin playing clarinets and find the one that you want. So, and, and also the, the other caveat to that is 
if you are going to schedule a visit to our North American headquarters, it is with the intent to purchase a clarinet. Uh, we, we don't want you to come in here and, and just be a, a tire kicker and, and say, okay, well, that was fun, thanks, and, and, and not purchase an instrument. The intent to visit us, and I think most people, if you're going to travel a long way to come here, your plan is to buy a clarinet. So, uh, but yeah, we, we love welcoming people here. It's a lot of fun, and uh, it's always a real treat for us to help someone find an instrument that works best for them. Yeah, speaking speaking of inventory and that kind of stuff, you know, how, how are clarinets arriving to the headquarters there? You know, how do they, are, are they shipped on a ship? Or are they flown in or how do, how do clarinets arrive? Most of the time they come uh, over the ocean, they come on a boat. Um, and uh, we get, typically we get deliveries from France uh, a couple of times a month. Um, and uh, it, without getting into the gory details of planning and everything, you know, we, we get different models every month. So our inventory uh, for a particular model may be better one month than the next. Our 13 inventory is always very good. We always have a, a good selection from which to choose. The higher end models like the, the Festival or the Tradition or Tosca or Prestige, uh, those inventory levels vary. So you may find that one month we have a really good selection and the next month it may be a little bit lower. So that, again, that's another reason we ask that people make an appointment ahead of time just to make sure if you are looking for one of those higher end clarinets that we have a good inventory for you to, for, to from which to choose. Yeah. And just so everyone knows that stores have to do the same thing as individuals. <laughs> That's right. They have to make sure there's inventory there and make it worth your time. And, you know, sometimes it's a waiting game and that's just what we do to get what we are, what we want in our stock. So. Well, that's a great point. You know, as I mentioned earlier, Tori has, has come to Jacksonville many times to select out clarinets for MMI. And I believe there have been a couple of instances where Tori has been looking for specific models and we've just been honest and said, Tori, you, we need to wait a month to make sure that we're going to have adequate stock because we, we want the best selection for MMI from which to choose. And um, if, if we don't feel like we have a good selection at the moment, we're going to be honest and say, let's, let's wait until next month just so you're really confident and, and comfortable with what you're selecting for the store's yeah. inventory. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. So do you know, this kind of fun fact, do you know how many clarinets are being made in general, like from buffet? I know it's kind of a loaded question, but is there any fun facts you can share with that? I, you know, I, I don't really, and it, it's, it's kind of a complex question because of the fact that we have clarinets that are from high-end professional all the way to student clarinets. Sure. And the professional clarinets are made at our factory in Montlaville. France, outside of Paris. Um, we have a second manufacturing facility in Martinikirchen, Germany. And that's where uh, the wood student clarinets are made, like the E11. That's where the E12F semi-professional clarinet is assembled after the uh, components come from France. And then we have our student, our plastic student clarinet facility, which makes our Prodige and our premium student clarinets. And that's located outside of uh, Shanghai, China. So when you get into the student clarinets, you're talking about thousands of clarinets annually. The professional clarinets globally, we're probably looking at um, hundreds, maybe, maybe into the thousands when you talk about the clarinets that are made for all the different territories. But um, you know, I, I'd say in our inventory right now, we probably have a few hundred professional clarinets and that's all the different models, R13, Festival, Tradition. Prominently R13, of course, because that's that's the clarinet that most people are interested in. But uh, it's it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, I hope people can also chime in. There's a great um, factory tour video that people can can look at, and that's really fun to see, kind of the inside, you know, perspective and some really cool details there. So I hope people can check that out too. I, I encourage you to check that out just because it, it's fascinating. Of course, going there in person is, is the best, but the, the factory video that Tori's talking about is really terrific because it gives you an inside look at a lot of what I refer to as the old ways because a lot of the production of our clarinets is, is steeped in manufacturing processes from the late 1800s 
and early 1900s. And, and to be honest, we've, we've had a lot of innovation and a lot of modernization of, of the, the production process, but a lot of it is the same as it was 100 years ago. And, and I think, I think that, that's kind of what makes it cool. It's very cool. <laughs> it's very cool. Excellent. It's been great spending time with both of you. If, if anybody does have any questions, um, they're welcome to email me. I mean, my job as Woodwind Product Specialist is to educate and help people select an instrument. So if you'd like to email me, you can send me an email. It's matt.vance at buffetcrumpon.com. And I love to hear from people all over the country, United States and Canada. Um, if you have questions about any of our clarinets or any of our other woodwinds, feel free to drop me a line. I'm happy to help. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate learning more about the inside details of buffet clarinets and kind of, you know, just some fun, fun facts for people, our clarinet nerds to know. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. And thanks to Midwest Musical Imports for their support of Buffet Grampon. They're a great partner for us. And, and we look forward to working with MMI for many years in the future. Mm -hmm.